I've read the news as fast as I could, actually. All over the country, there are people looking at their watches and saying, God, I'm sure it was meant to finish at 6.30. <laughs> uh, anyway, here, here we are, despite the traffic, and um, uh, looking forward to what I hope will be about uh, just over an hour of uh, discussion um, and debate uh, about Sri Lankan uh, literature. Um, I suppose um, some people here and we will wonder whether there is such a thing, actually, as Sri Lankan literature, or indeed whether our three uh, amazing authors are, can truly be called Sri Lankan, given that they've all had, uh, have different connections with, with the country. So maybe we'll um, discuss some of that um, in, the, in the next hour or so. I think probably what is true to say, and I think one of the reasons Asia House has uh, had this evening today, is, is that perhaps Sri Lankan literature from Sri Lanka or about Sri Lanka perhaps hasn't had um, as, as much of the uh, public spotlight as, as it might have, and one can compare it. If we were earlier on, although we nearly started the debate um, in, in, the, in the green room, uh, one might look at countries like Nigeria and India, for example, and, and the authors they have produced and the kind of uh, coverage and, and plaudits they receive. Um, what is also true to say, I think in this country certainly, is that people's views of, uh, of, of Sri Lanka have been largely, probably, mediated through people like me, merchants of doom and gloom sitting in newsrooms and going foreign correspondents to go out and tell the story. And uh, while there is certainly that kind of story to be told about Sri Lanka uh, and, and what's happened in, that, in Sri Lanka over the last 30, 40 years, um, as a journalist, I'm happy and, and to admit that it is a rather singular prism through which to look at uh, not just Sri Lanka, but any country, and, and that uh, the nuances, if you like, of life in a country are sometimes missed by um, something, a medium that is essentially a front page medium. Uh, we only have uh, the front page, whereas these guys have between them, I don't know, about 1,200 pages, actually, in these three books um, to talk about, about Sri Lanka. So. Um, if, if you're one of those people who feels you don't know enough about Sri Lanka because all you've heard is, is what people like me, journalists, have told you about, these uh, three authors are going to change that for you and, and through their literature, through their creations, are going to give you, um, I hope, a feel about uh, Sri Lanka but also the diaspora that it is uh, spawned. Now, the way we're going to do it, I tend to run things pretty informally, so. I mean, you probably will have to stick your hand up just so I know that you want to ask a question, but otherwise we'll keep it nice and relaxed. Um, and what I'm going to do is ask our, our three um, authors to just uh, have a, spend about three, four minutes telling us what their books are about, because I'm assuming um, not all of you have read all three books. You might have read one of them, but not all three of them. So let's uh, let them give us an idea and perhaps a little reading just to get a flavour of their writing. Um, and then as, as, as chair, I, I reserve the right to ask the first question. Um, and then after that, we'll throw it over to you and hopefully you'll have lots of questions. Uh, for. It's, it's a tough one to uh, sum up in a sentence, but I'll, uh, I'll try. So I'm going to be reading from China and The Legend of Goody Matthew. Uh, it's been called a cricket book, but uh, I like to think of it as a drunken detective story of uh, a drunk who tried to track down this mythical cricketer who spent his entire life drinking Eric and watching cricket. And, um, so the passage I'm going to read to you, um, it's called Sport Versus Life, and this is where the narrator W.G. Karnasena um, ponders on why he has been so obsessed over sport all his life. My wife asks me why I love sport more than her, more than I do my son and our life together. I tell her that she is talking nonsense, but perhaps she isn't. Some people gaze at setting suns, sitting mountains, teenage virgins and their winking thighs. But I see beauty in free kicks, late cuts, slam dunks, tries from halfway, and balls that turn from off to leg. In sport, has beans can step onto a plate and smash a last ball into oblivion. A village can travel to Manchester for a cup tie and topple a giant. Villains can heroes become. In 1996, subcontinental flair overcame Western precision, and the world's nobodies thrashed the world's bullies. Sixty years earlier, a black man ridiculed Nazi race theory with five gold medals in Berlin before Mein Fuhrer's furious eyes. In real life, justice is rarely poetic, and too often, 
rarely visible. Good sits in a corner, collects a check, and pays a mortgage. Evil builds empires. In real life, if you find yourself chasing 30 runs of 20 balls, you will often fall short, even with all your wickets in hand. Real life is lived at two runs and over, with a dodgy LBW every decade. In real life, as Sri Lankan cricket grows sweeter, your wife will grow sourer. <laughs> the All Blacks may underachieve for two more decades, but your son will disappoint you more. I hope you read this, Garfield. I hope you forgive. The answer to my wife's question is of course a no. I would go down on a hail of bullets for her and for Garfield many times over. And while Arvind de Silva has delighted me on many an occasion, I wouldn't even take a blister for him. But the truth, Sheila, is bigger than both of us, whether it be written on the subway walls or the belly of a Lagerlouts t-shirt. In 30 years, the world will not care about how I lived. But in 100 years, Bulgarians will still talk of Lechkov and how he expelled the mighty West Germans from the 1994 World Cup with a simple header. Sport can unite worlds, tear down walls, and transcend race, the past, and all probability. Unlike life, sport is eternal. Unlike life, sport matters. Um, homesick is, um, uh, it's interlinked short stories. Uh, short story often puts um, an English audience off for some reason, um, which is why I interlink them, because then the book can work as a novel. Um, each, so the book starts with a story called Homesick, which is set um, at a party in 1983, a New Year's Eve party, um, in which you are introduced to a, a lot of different characters, um, and some people have accused me of it being slightly confusing. Um, each of these characters then goes on to have their own short story. Um, and what I was trying to do was perhaps chart um, the journey of multiculturalism, that sounds very arrogant, or rather very ambitious, but the, the journey of multiculturalism from about the 1950s onwards um, through uh, this small Sri Lankan community in London. Um, and it is no coincidence, obviously, that I grew up in a small community in southeast London. Um, the, the people in this book are not um, painted from life, um, but of course they are. And they are composites of many people that I have met. Um, and um, essentially, I was, I was trying to show um, the, the second generation's experience of growing up in England, uh, where they're trying to serve a culture that is way over there somewhere, that is pretty alien to them, but they live every day um, at home while being English and while growing up in London. Um, I'm going to read to you from this last bit of the party, which um, is, as I said, a New Year's Eve party. Victor stops everything. It is nearly midnight. Let's count down. Ten, nine, eight. Before he can continue, the noise from upstairs throbs the counts for him. What is that, he says, but he knows it is his children. Another song, someone shouts. Three, two, one, Wesley says, and then Happy New Year, and everyone shouts Happy New Year to each other, and there are kisses all around Victor, but the music goes on upstairs so that as the people kiss each other in his sitting room and their colours mix like a kaleidoscope into smoky patterns, he becomes angry. He remembers home, the New Year's when he was a teenager, the faces he kissed there, the night heat and rain, and his mother's orchids, their silhouettes in the moonlight. He remembers the smell of the warmth of drying coconut and rice. But he, remember, he remembers also his father's stinging switch, his mother's face turned away. He wants to get to Nandini because he's all out of it, of the party, of the friends, of his children. Nowhere he can find home, but if he found Nandini, it would be there, in her, and he would be safe again. Upstairs, the dancing does not stop. They show off to each other. They dance, brothers and sisters together. They dance because they can. They're exhausted, but they push on. They push each other on because they are new. They are the ones. Downstairs later. What to do, Ciro says to Nanthony. She is determined to marry him. What to do? Good, let her make a good marriage, Nanthony says. Wesley and Victor sit with them in the dining room. Many people have gone. 
Gertie and her brothers sit on the opposite side of the table. Good, good, these children will never go back, Gertie says. Let them make marriages here. But with white fellows, her brother asks. Why not, Gertie asks sharply. You think once you give them all this, you can take them back there, take it all away? Why not, Wesley says. They can get used to anything. They are not English. They are ours. What rubbish, Nunthony says, and Cyril agrees with the nodding of her quiet head. What is their mother tongue now, the brother says. What does it matter, Victor says. Language, it is important. What is their mother tongue? Ask me what is mine, Victor says. It is the same as theirs. We speak in the language we live in. It is not important. What language do you dream in, the brother asks. Dreams, Wesley answers for Victor. We live in our dreams. We do not need to dream. They all laugh. The children come downstairs. Vita sits on Wesley's knee. Preeti throws her arm around Victor. What is your mother tongue, the brother says to them both. Preeti shrugs. Vita says, oh my God, are you arguing about all that stuff again? Do you want to know? I will show you, Nandini says, and she elbows Ciro and the two of them together poke their tongues out, catching the tips with their fingers. Nandini crosses her eyes. Victor laughs, but he wants to cry. We belong nowhere, he says, but if we belong anywhere, it is here. I have chosen here, he stands. We have chosen here, and that is it, he says, flicking his wrist up as if tossing an imaginary cricket ball into the air. We are here. Um, George called me yesterday on the telephone and said, um, uh, you've written this book. Can you tell us in about... Uh, three or four minutes, what are you trying to do? And so for the last 24 hours, I've been trying to work out what am I trying to do? Um, and I think what I'm trying to do with this book is what I've tried to do with everything that I've written in fiction, which is to create a world in a book. That's all, really. And with this book, I suppose, I wanted to try and uh, go to a place or create a world that was um, as... Uh, richly imaginative, I guess, as Sri Lanka in Reef, uh, but somewhere else. So I thought I'd go to Mauritius in my book. Um, and I thought, actually, I quite like redrawing boundaries and things, so it's quite nice to be here in Asia House and um, talk about a book where it's not just Asia, actually. It seems to me it's where Asia... Africa and Europe sort of collide. Um, and in the next two minutes, I'd like to try and take you there to my Mauritius. So I'll read from this book. Um, I'll just read the first page, really, but I'll read it uh, from a piece of paper because it's easier to hold the mic and this together. Almost impossible otherwise. And I'm going to stand, and I'm going to take my glasses off and I'll stand at the edge because my publisher's here, and she likes her authors to live dangerously. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm going to try to be as dangerous as I can. If I fall and nobody has a phone here, I've got one in my pocket. 999, I think, is the number to call. Um, so Mauritius, please go to Mauritius. It's 1825. And <clears throat> it's... The time when the British have taken over Mauritius from the French. They've also taken over Sri Lanka, Ceylon then, making inroads into India and so on. Um, they've started shipping prisoners from India and from Sri Lanka to Mauritius because slavery is coming to an end. But the, the big idea of indentured labor hasn't dawned on anyone yet. Uh, they've exiled a prince from Ceylon to Mauritius, uh, and he's just arrived along with his interpreter. But we are going to arrive with Lucy Gladwell, who's a young girl from London. She's 19. Her head is full of John Keats and other romantic poets, dreams, um, and imaginings. And this is how we begin. The bay was bright and blue. On the edge, the small island port lay basking in the sun. Only in her dreams had Lucy Gladwell seen such dazzling light spilling from the sky. The anchor dropped, 
to a rousing cheer. The drumming of fists and feet, firkins and kilderkins, kegs and clogs and pails and mops rolled around the ship. After five months at sea, at last, the liberty had arrived. Take a hold of your hat, my dear, Betty Hyten warned her niece, as Lucy was lowered over the side in her chair. You wouldn't want that in the water now, would you? Never mind the hat. There are gurnards, dragonfish, and sharks lurking beneath the surface, Lucy thought. And here I am, dangling in midair, close to tipping into the sea. Before the apparatus had come to rest, Lucy jumped onto the narrow skiff, waiting to ferry them to the pier. Mrs. Hyten pinned her from the top deck with a sharp grey eye. Over to the left, Lucy, if you would. A pale, clean-shaven stray moon bobbed up next to her aunt. Steady, Miss Gladwell, the Reverend Constantine beamed. Be careful. Lucy rolled her eyes and blew out a silent repost. Would the two of them never stop? She wiggled towards the stern and lodged her case against the side. On top, she balanced a small gift box, neatly tied with a red ribbon. Hat clamped tight, she sat, feeling raggedy, coarsened by salt, but stuffed full of sea dreams, excited to be on the brink of a new life. There was never a landfall as sweet as this. Thank you. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So let's uh, let's start. Now, having listened to, to all three of you, clearly you're all authors, one, you're all talented authors, two. But in what way are you Sri Lankan? As far as I know, I mean I think you all should share how you work in Singapore at the moment, you don't live there, and you were born here, um, Roshi, and, and you also grew up um, all over the place. So in what sense, um, what do you think of it? What sense do you see yourself, if you do, as a Sri Lankan? Um, it's, it's a very interesting question because when people ask me where I come from, um, I say South East London um, or from wherever I'm, you know, living at the time. Um, and, you know, when people are persistent in England, as they often are, I then say, well, my parents were Sri Lankan. Um, but I feel I'm firmly British. What I do feel, though, as an author, um, I feel that uh, Sri Lankan nurse, I suppose, um, comes out in the way that I write, in the fluidity of it, in um, in the the poetry. Uh, because if you if you understand singular, uh, uh, all I mean, I suppose Tamil as well, although I don't understand Tamil. Um, there is a there is a, po a poetic nature and a jokiness to the language that is just this natural flow. Um, I also think that it's um, it, it, the the nature of the book that I've written is it reflects uh, um, it's it's a composite book. So the stories are about individuals uh, who make up a community. That is a very important strand thing. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, um, so are you, I mean, there's a character in your book, Prithi, who also is asked by her friends, where do you come from, and objects to it, and so is, is that you? Uh, yeah, well, no, I really used to really object to it, because I really wanted, uh, because I wanted my, well, when you're making your identity as a teenager, you want to just be seen as, uh, just as everyone else, which is a really ridiculous thing, because you're not just like everybody else. Um, I do resent it when my children are asked that. You know, um, my son was working in a... Um, I'm going to say a bad word now. I, I do apologise. But my son was working in a cafe, and he was persistently asked by an older couple who actually probably recognised that he was part Sri Lankan because they'd gone to Sri Lanka or something like that. And he was waiting on tables quite busily. And they kept saying, so where are you from? And he said, oh, I'm from Stroud. And then he said... Oh, no, well, we, you know, then they asked again, and, oh, yeah, no, we moved up there from London, and, no, where are you from? And eventually he just said, I came out of a vagina in southeast London, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, which, you know, kind of stopped the question, but, I mean, it, 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 it is consistently okay. asked. All right, you know. I'm going to move on to you, Ramesh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not the same one, I don't think. I didn't come out of it. If you wanted to stop the question, yeah. you might the question. But here well, you are in 
the sense defining yourself yeah. as part of it. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, the odd thing is actually these days people don't ask as quite as much as they used to. I don't know if they've noticed that. You know, it's kind of the, the, the big unanswered, uh, unasked question is where you're from. And actually, I have started asking people where they're from because I really want to know. Uh, and it's really interesting. But um, on the Sri Lankan thing, I suppose, aren't we all Sri Lankan, actually, wherever you are? Because, um, I don't know, this idea of identity seems to me so fluid. Um, and I was just thinking, um, there's, a, there's a little thing, a little passage, I don't have the book with me, the last book, the match where there's a guy who's trying to, in a sense, find out his identity. He goes to a cricket match, and there's a little bit in there which comes from a real match where you know, there was a crowd chant at this um, uh, uh, match where it was Indian, it was uh, India against Sri Lanka, I think. And one of the chants was about, um, uh, it started out about who is an Indian, and, and it just went on and on, and it went on about, you know, uh, it ended up by saying, you know, they were talking about the cricketers being Indian, and then it went on to saying things like, well, Becker was an Indian. Uh, and then Henman will be an Indian, <laughs> you know, because all heroes have to be Indian, Indian yeah. you know. And then Sri Lanka was doing really well, and then everyone said, well, everyone's Sri Lankan now, and then they were all cheering, because in a sense, identities change. That, do you think you could have written the books you did, in, 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 which, in which you have, if you have written these books, where identity and searching for it plays quite a key part, even if it is oh, yes. in this one, Lucy Gladwell looking for her identity. Could you have written that if, if all you were was a Sri Lankan, in other words, if you hadn't done the travelling, Well, that's kind of a, almost an impossible what if, isn't it? I mean, in a sense, you write because you are, it's all about being an individual. And I don't know, it's a bit like, I don't know, when people talk about Chinese uh, poetry, it's about, or, or Spanish poetry, it's about almost a line from the heavens coming straight through to you, which is, it's only you, only you can write this word, is the kind of feeling you have to have. So I guess you're, the closest, really, to Sri Lanka. I'm, in... I'm the most authentic here, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, by the way, I've seen, uh, the way, I've seen one hand go up, so do um, sort of stick a hand up if you want me to, to um, if you want to ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I, uh, I faced a similar question. I was on a panel for South Asian literature with an uh, Indian writer, Pakistani writer, Bangladeshi writer, and myself, and they were asked, what makes you all South Asian? And none of us wanted to uh, jump up to the question. The Indian writer said, well, I think um, we all enjoy eating dal curry. And <laughs> that, is, that is what we have in common. That's what binds, binds the region. Um, but I mean, OK, I, I grew up in Sri Lanka, but I did study in New Zealand. And um, I'm only Kiwi when I'm applying for a visa or uh, when, I'm, when I'm watching rugby. Those are the two times I'm Kiwi. But otherwise, it's Sri Lanka. But things I, I have event like this, and, and, and I know why Asia has to put it on, I'm glad you have put it on, but is it useful then to be talking about what are we doing, we're refreshing this Sri Lanka? Where... I think anything is useful, if we can yeah. bring a crowd together and they might buy some books. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't matter what, what, what the ladder is. The thing is, I'm quite, I have approached this quite cynically, um, because I tried writing novels when I was in New Zealand, when I lived in London, and what I, it paralyzed me writing novels in London because every idea has been done before. There seems to be this, this need to create this sense of community, so if I just meet you, I have to find out where you went yeah. to school, and I knew someone who went to blah, 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 and yeah. you have to find that. Um, and I think a lot of Sri Lankans who go abroad, what they enjoy the most is the anonymity. But isn't, but isn't that isn't that sort of growing all over the world? I mean, isn't that what Facebook and all yes, the other well, social true, media too, is yes, about? Yeah. It's about finding out and making these links all the time. So maybe it's a Sri Lankan thing that's just spread. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Sri Lankans invented social media. Ramesh can say for says. <laughs> Are you tweeting that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in your book, there's all sorts of conversations going on. But the, the Tamil Sinhalese conversation doesn't go on at all, does it? Nobody's asking each other or you guessing or anything like that, is it? Uh, well, the reason I wrote a book about cricket was I wanted to avoid all of that kind of stuff. I thought I'd write a light book that dealt with our national obsession. Um, and But the thing is, those things seep into the book yeah. later on. But I, I just found it interesting to be able to write a book about Sri Lanka and have the war happening on the periphery. I mean, it's set in the 80s and the 90s where the war is raging. raging. But um, I just thought... Um, 
perhaps it's possible because we were we li grew up in Colombo, and we were cocooned by this. Okay, there there used to be bombs going off when we were going to school, but a lot of the time we lived in our own little bubble. The war was happening elsewhere. Yeah, was and it, I mean, the key question, and, and I suppose you know, I haven't lived. I was six when, when about five to when my family left. That bubble didn't have to be Singhalese or Tamil or Bodo or whatever. I mean, in that sense, was your was your Tamil defined by ethnicity? In Colombo, I, I don't think so at all. Um, I, I think, and especially when you're talking about sports, and you're because most of my the scenes here are I'm watching drunks watching sport, and uh, when you're when you're sitting there, I don't think the, this conversation enters because it's not not relevant. We just uh, care about the guy who's bowling and whether he's bowling at the wicket and whether he's turning the ball. We don't care what his ethnicity is, and I think uh, it is a case that uh, talent tends to transcend all of these things. It's good to know. Uh, is it working? Yeah. Um, Roshi referred slightly to my question. Uh, I, I, the impression I get is all three of you write in English, and I wondered whether any of you had ever written in Singhala or Tamil or whichever other languages you speak, and, and how different your writing would be if you were to write in one of your other languages. Right. Well, uh, have, uh, let's, uh, Ramesh, have you written in any other language? No, simply, English is the only language I have to write in. Translated into many other languages. Translated, you? yes, yeah. but I have no idea whether no. that's mine or somebody else's. <laughs> um, never, never. I'm born, bred in England, spoke English my whole life. I understand Sinclair because it's the language my parents spoke to keep the secrets, you know, so it's the first language you learn. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, English is a, a composite language. And um, uh, it's, it's so, uh, again, very fluid, and it takes on um, jargons from so many different cultures in London. You know, you have the most marvelous ways of using English just with a slight intonation to show that, you know, someone of a different nation is speaking just by missing out one word, you can do that. It's the best language in the world. But I would say that because I don't speak any other. Yeah. Uh, I did study in Sinhalese, uh, but um, Sinhalese is still my second language, I'm ashamed to say. Um, I, at the moment, I, I'm, I'm on a program where I'm watching, I'm listening to Sinhal and Tamil music, I'm watching local movies and trying to read um, local novels, but the fact is, yeah, it is a different world, the English writing world and the Sinhalese writing world and the Tamil writing world. But I, I do take your point that it is possible to kind of mimic the rhythms of the language um, of Singhal and Tamil by using English, by altering your syntax and all of that. And um, yeah, that's what I've gone for. I mean, I would like to write in Singhal, but I think that's a few years away if I, I really need to. And what get would my... you, I mean, having uh, read the books, what you do get is, is some of the slang, some of the odd words. And to me, I mean, although I don't speak either Tamil or Singhal, you understand Tamil. It brought back, you know, took me back to a rather warm and cosy place because, you know, the, the Machans and the Ades and so on, all these little words thrown in English, which is what, which is what the Sri Lankans do all the time, you know, they, they throw in the odd word from, from the, the Sometimes I use it just because I'm homesick for it, you know, because I, because actually I noticed uh, with my own, my parents' generation that when we were growing up, their language was much more inflected with Machang and and Ane and Ayu and all of that. Nothing at all these days. <laughs> None of it, Mum. <laughs> yes. Just wait for the microphone. Um, <clears throat> I find uh, your uh, presentation very interesting. Uh, what I'd like to know is that, uh, first of all, before I ask the question, is that are you um, of which ones are you of Tamil origin and which ones uh, Sinhalese in, in, in terms of mother tongues? I mean, apart from English. Go on, you, uh, are, fair, are you, fair enough question. Sinhalese. You're, you're Sinhalese. You're, you're my, my parents both Sinhalese. Sinhalese. Sinhalese myself. Sinhalese. Go ahead. And, 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 and I'm Tamil. Yeah. You're Tamil, okay. Now, uh, one, of, one of the things, uh, com look, comparing it with the situation in India, for instance, where there are several languages, 
And uh, one of the things which has uh, come out is that pre-independence, 1947, there was an immense amount of novels and things, particularly in the Bengali language and also in Tamil. Tamil is you know, also a very, very uh, you know, profusion of uh, novels and things and ideas. Post-independence, they've taken largely to English and there have been some great English you know, writers in English. Uh, for whatever reason, I mean, they've now adopted English more or less. And although the novels and writings and vernacular are still continuing and Bengali is still you know, quite widespread. Now, I don't know how, what the, how this applies to Sri Lanka, because I know in Sri Lanka, uh, the educational standards have been very high. So there's, there seems to be an, a sort of uh, overlap here, you know, in that people may have drifted, you know, from their roots okay. and... Yeah. Uh, yes, there is a similarity. Um, there's a big difference as well, I think. Um, one of the big differences was post-independence, post language became a much bigger issue. Uh, the very famous uh, prime minister, one of the great leaders, Bandaranaike, actually, SWRT Bandaranaike, said, you know, language was an issue to excite the people, and he used the language issue a great deal to excite the people. Um, and the role of English, I think, was quite important in this, because unlike in India, it, became, it, it, it sort of lost its place um, in Sri Lanka after, after independence. There's been a long, long tradition of writing in English, uh, going back to the 1800s, middle 1800s, and there were many, many novels written in English as well. But for really the period when I was growing up, um, writing in English was really quite a bad thing to do. I mean, it was seen as the op oppressor's language. It was the sword that cut the mother tongue. Um, and the writers of previous generations of uh, writers in English, I don't know, Shaham, perhaps you may know some of them, had a very, very hard time um, in, in getting their getting their writing really recognized. And the readership, though there's a, well, there was a huge English language readership, they didn't read the novels that came from there. Um, and it's only, I think, in, I suppose, in the last 20 years it's been growing. And in the last 10 years, I certainly see a big, big difference where that issue of ownership of the English language and its, um, and, and all the negative sides of it have started to go away. Politically, perhaps not, but I mean, there are many, many more people writing in English. I think it's so. more pragmatic, isn't it? That it, it, you can be able to market a book that's in English to well, a far, far wider audience. I was going to say, because, <laughs> I mean, the Gaul Literary Festival is, is now slowly rising up the league table of festivals. And I, I, and I know have all three of you been there. Yes. Um, do they have um, um, Sinhalese literature, Tamil literature, the festival, <laughs> sessions, or is it all in English? They're having a few more now, but um, it's pretty on the deal. <laughs> and is that down just to, to money? Basically, if you want if you want to have a market with people buying books, you've got to write in English. I think okay. With the case of the Gaul Literary Festival, um, they have a disclaimer that it's not a Sri Lankan literary festival. It's an international festival that happens to be set in this lovely setting. So that's how they sidestep. Because it it has been a contentious issue over the years that. Um, it seems to be kind of this elitist English-speaking event. Um, they have now involved the local community a bit more, and there are a few more uh, local writers in there speaking local languages. But um, I don't know if it's a case of economics. I think it's just a case of that they just wanted to have an international festival, and they didn't claim to be representative. Um, but, but, so you were, you, you're sort of ruining the fact that people aren't writing anymore in, in, the, in, in, well, in, the, in your case, Indian language. But that's not entirely true. There is a lot of writing in India in the other languages. And in Sri Lanka, there's a lot of writing in Sinhala and a lot of writing in Tamil. Um, it's and just in India, there's a further reach because you have Bollywood and you have... In Jaipur, I, 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 we went to the Jaipur Literary Festival and I, the most wonderful thing ever was to see a poet being mobbed. <laughs> um, be, you know, literally being followed down the street because he writes for Bollywood, but he is a poet. You know, so these languages are still being served, but in a different medium. That's all. Yeah. This is for all three of you. Uh, 
it is what what is the prime motivation is it to tell something to the world or to bring forward your observations that you have made of the society or to tell a story that will be uh, liked by many what is the prime motivation because i have actually entered that profession very recently i have already written two books and the third one is being printed but they are all non fiction it's on buddhism so there we are what is the prime motivation so is it uh, yeah let's praise that i mean would you be uh, happy to have a book that got lots of awards for being brilliant but sold about three copies or would you rather write a rubbish book that sell uh, a million I'd, I'd like to do both. I, I feel that I have done both, and it will happen eventually. <laughs> I, th I think um, uh, the, the motivation to write comes from um, uh, two things. Um, yes, themes. Sim you know, the, 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 uh, I suppose what we'll call the political, but also... Um, I love a good story, and I love. I, it comes from character mainly. It comes from watching people, and and um, uh, you know there are things in the book where. But, okay, let's sorry. Think, how, how does it start? The first book, the first essay. Was there something bursting, you know, in you bursting to be told that you had to get it out, or was it simply I want to be a writer, so I better start thinking of things to write about? Oh, you want me to answer yeah. that one? Um, yeah, no, I uh, uh, a little bit of both. I've been writing for a long time. I think, I think, funnily enough, that the one th that homesick is the one where uh, I was bursting to say something, where uh, I'd crafted and crafted before, you know, um, and not been successful because I didn't have anything to say, um, and now I did, and. Um, so I think people want to read what you have to say as well. People want to read the messages, but they want them nicely sugared. <laughs> how, about you, how about you, Jean? What's your motivation? Well, I, initially I wanted to make millions and meet lots of girls. And, and then I, I realized that uh, if you want to make millions and meet lots of girls, writing a book's perhaps the last thing you should be doing. <laughs> um, but... Um, for me, it was just, I definitely wasn't writing for the world because if you're writing, if you're in Colombo writing um, a Sri Lankan story, you don't think that it's going to even go to India. So I just thought, I was just interested in, in the idea that the greatest cricketer of all time could have lived in, could have been unfortunate enough to play for Sri Lanka in the 80s. And that was, I just thought it was a decent idea. And I think my main motivation is reading other Sri Lankan books so you, I mean, you get inspired by people like Ondachi and uh, Karl Muller and the guy who wrote Reef and Monkfish Moon. Um, the, these, uh, so when I, because now you walk into a Sri Lankan bookshop and there's a, there's a section on Sri Lankan writing, which wasn't the case when I was growing up. You might find a couple of books here and there, but um, now there's a shelf dedicated to it. Not all of it is great, but it's being written. So one motivation was the, the guys who inspired me, but also the bad books. Like you pick up a book that's published sitting next between Stephen King and John Grisham, and it's a Sri Lankan writer, and it's pretty terrible. And um, that motivated me more thinking, you know, I could, if I stumble on a good enough story, I could uh, perhaps do something better. So, but I wasn't thinking of, uh, I certainly wasn't thinking of coming to London and talking about it. It just seemed like an interesting idea and worth spending a year of my life on. Ramesh, you've just been kind of elevated to el elder states. <laughs> well, uh, oh, well, I mean, in my youth, you know. Has your motivation, does motivation change? I mean, what yeah, happens oh, when you Yeah, oh, absolutely. When, I, when I was 15 and 16 writing, it was o overcome my shyness with girls. Um, and to... Uh, to provide entertainment for this slowly growing num circle of friends I had, which I didn't realize I could have, but I managed to do because of writing a few funny poems and stories. Um, but then I suppose, what's my primary motivation? I don't know, I just think these, these things, these little, little boxy looking things are just magic. When I was growing up, I thought they were magic, absolute magic. Um, I mean, they're only, you know, hardy boys and 
little later, Mickey Spillane, or you know, something <laughs> like that. But still, they were magic. And I wanted to kind of do something like that, create something like that. So it's really, I just want to make something. And, and I'm using words to do it. So there is actually a, a sort of genre of the cricketing novel. I wasn't aware of that either. I thought it was a regional idea, but um, since then, um, yeah, they've dug up a lot of... And I think it's obvious because the game goes on for so damn long that um, you, need, you have this need to mythologize it. And um, so it's far more likely that you'd write a book about cricket than beach volleyball, I suppose. What, what does doing it through a sport, and I guess people have done, I mean, there have been books in America with a great baseball problem and so on. What does doing it through sport and then... Ramesh, you as well, because you've written a map. But what does doing it through cricket, doing it through a sport, allow you to do that, say, Ramesh, you couldn't do? I've written a cricket story. Have you done a cricket? One of my stories is a cricket story. (laughs) For goodness sake. (laughs) Well, the thing was, uh, I think it allows you to sidestep the big issues. And um, that was why I I went into it in the first place, because you can just write. But also... I think inherently there is drama in sport, which is why, I mean, the column inches are filled with um, endless meanderings about the EPL table and who's going up and who's going down. I think we have this need to mythologize sport. And I just thought that um, there was enough drama inherent, even in a five-day test match, and that it could be brought to a page. But you couldn't quite bring yourself to leave the other stuff out, as you say, it insinuates itself periodically and, and the intention was to leave it out, and um, but it just kept seeping in. I mean, if you're writing about the 80s and the 90s, um, however peripheral, the war had to come in. And then, um, I so mean, did I didn't... You, sorry to interrupt, but did, did, so did you find that that's literally what happened as you were writing? It insinuated, insinuated itself into your writing, that you know, almost without you wanting it to be there, you found you were writing about these episodes of violence, <laughs> about Buddhism. It's all there, isn't it? Yeah, these themes came later. It just occurred to me that, um, you know, cricket is arguably the only thing we've been truly world-class at. And it's, uh, I mean, I'm sure most of you have been to Sri Lanka. It's a wonderful country. Yeah, I heard that stat that uh, in the 90s, highest uh, per capita consumption, which are more than the Irish and the Australians. um, We're champions. of Eric, but it just seemed like okay, over 50 years of independence this was the one thing that we were truly world class at and um, yeah, but in answer to your question yeah, I was trying to write a harmless book about drunks and cricket but um, yeah, bombs started going off um, throughout the pages and I couldn't help it yeah. and how about you, Well, I, I wrote the match when I did because I thought Pretty soon, someone like Shehan is going to come and write a cricket novel, and I want to get in there first. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I also, I, I think, um, writing about uh, how you bring sport in, I think it's very difficult. I mean, I never thought I would write it because I'm not a sports writer. I'm not, uh, I'm not a huge spectator of sport either. But uh, I was asked to write a short story about cricket uh, here in London. Um, at, for some event in a museum or whatever, and I said, I couldn't possibly do that. I said, no, no, can you please? And so I did write a story, and I found I could write... I enjoyed myself writing the story about a little boy playing cricket. And at the reading, there was a guy uh, who, had, who was reading from a book he'd written, and he was one of the actors from that uh, fabulous film, Lagan, if you know La- Lagan. Uh, he was one of the Englishmen uh, in that film. And so we were chatting uh, just before the readings, and he said, you know, there are a lot of people who go to cricket matches, to, uh, to long test matches, and really they have nothing to do because they're not really watching the game half the time. You know, they're having a sip of a drink. Or whatever. And what they really need, you know, besides the Telegraph or the Guardian or whatever they're looking at, is a good book to read. Why don't you write one? So I thought about that for a bit, and eventually I thought, yeah, that's a good idea. But, you know, my publisher is a terrible marketing idea. They don't buy books, really. But um, anyway, that's how that started. Okay. And, uh, well, now I wrote, I wrote my cricket story, too, um, um, uh, because it was about the Tebbit test. It's called Test. And, it's, yeah. and, and so it was about um, a, a man is it, is taking his... familiar with the Tebbit test? 
No, so you've got to explain. Oh, well, the Tebbit test is what Norton Tebbit said, uh, that, that, uh, the way that you tested a, a person's um, loyalty, loyalty to, to uh, this country was which team they supported um, in, in the cricket. And, um, I mean, what Jahan said was, I mean, I think the reason there is a cricket genre is that cricket is actually more important than life. It is, it is so important, and, and we were always brought up you, with, you with can imagine my dilemma when England's playing um, Sri Lanka and I'm going to read the results. <laughs> <laughs> do I look gloomy when England uh, have done badly? Do I, do I smile when Sri Lanka You just have to badly? smile. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> And, and, and the, I mean, the, 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 the story I wrote was about uh, as, uh, a second generation chap taking his son to the cricket and the Barmy Army are there. And that's really interesting is that the Barmy Army song is everywhere we go, people want to know who we are, where we come from. And so I use that song in, because it's so perfect, you know, because it's what we were saying before. Everyone wants to know... You know, but anyway, that's beside the point. The, 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 the story is about the Sri Lankan team and how much um, it, it, Some of the characters in, in, in uh, Roshi's book, there's a, I thought, particularly poignant bit, actually, which, which um, I think helps, helps, understand your, uh, helps understand your question. Uh, and one of them, I can't remember who it is, says, in England we're different, in Sri Lanka we're different, nowhere is home. The book is called yes. Homesick, and yet yeah, the characters feel like Still, the writer puts a great deal of herself into the book. <laughs> so you think I'm homesick for something? <laughs> no, I, um, I, the, the, the reason it's called Homesick is that that was the, um, the theme that brought all of the stories together. Everyone in the book is homesick for something. It doesn't yeah. mean a country. It doesn't mean a place. It's a it could mean, yeah, 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 yeah. One something. person. Uh, it's about their sexuality. It's about um, a husband longing for his wife, even though she's sitting there. Yes. Um, you know, so many things you can feel homesick for, and it is how we define home, isn't it? I mean, home could just be, just you know, for me, it's my. My children and my dogs and my husband. But, my priorities were wrong. My husband and my children and my dogs. <laughs> He's over there. <laughs> why, why do those characters say that we're, you know, that they, they, they speak as if they're in a no man's land? I mean, clearly that's not your experience. You, your sound, anyone, anyway, that's the first time I've met you, but you seem incredibly comfortable in your skin and in your country. This that's time. because I'm an award winning writer. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, seriously, I walk taller simply because I've been published. I, I've always felt slightly kind of questioned, you know, what are you, who are you, what, why? You know, and, and we were talking before, weren't we? And you are questioned until you open your mouth and then I speak like this. And then people kind of go, oh, okay, you're, you're with us then. You know, that's, that's yeah. There you go. Um, well, I have written one of the stories that, uh, that I've written is called Meta General. Um, uh, it's the second last story in my book. And I, I felt I was sort of, um, I had to tread very, very carefully because I do feel very strongly that, um, it, that you're using other people's stories and then, uh, you, you know, you could just be using them just to earn some money. You know what I mean? Um, I want to use, uh, I want to talk about the war. Um, and Meta General does talk about uh, Preeti, who is one of the main characters in the book, um, goes to Sri Lanka and goes to uh, a war torn area and then is put into a camp. And she comes out again much later um, and she's raped there and so on. And um, she tries to write an, a novel. So it's called Meta General because it's a meta-fiction story. She tries to write a novel about it, and no one is interested. And what I was trying to say about the war within this story was that actually when it was happening, um, the human rights violations and so on, I mean, laudably on BBC, they were recorded, and Channel 4 has done quite a lot about it. But there wasn't the uproar that there was in other places. And... Um, so she writes this novel, sends it off. People say, well, actually, no one's going to be really interested apart from a couple of Guardian readers. And so then she translates this novel into um, a Holocaust novel. 
Um, and then it's taken up by, by the publishing houses. And that was my statement of saying, you know, if you have this 60-year gap between awards, then people can kind of take more interest in it or, or find it more interesting, sorry, or relevant. Sean, do you know if, if, if there, I mean, to answer the question, are there people writing now in Sri Lanka fiction based on one? And I'm thinking of like, I mentioned Nigeria at the beginning. Anyone who's read half, uh, read half a yellow sun by uh, Chimamanda Adichie, I mean, she has used the, the Biafra war to such great effect in, in literature. Is anyone doing that in Sri Lanka? It's, it's been a recurring theme in, in Sri Lankan writing. We've had from like, uh, David Blacker wrote uh, A Cause Untrue, which is very much in the pulp tradition, like a Tom Clancy kind of thriller, but I found that quite refreshing. Um, recently there have been, I don't know if it's, if it's fiction or non-fiction, but uh, Confessions of a Suicide Bomber, um, of a Tamil Tigress, that kind, which, which I haven't read yet. But it's the first time we're getting insider views of it, because a lot of the the writing about the war is from people who are living abroad who are kind of trying to imagine what this tragedy is so I do think there's a place for a place for it and it's, it is a huge void that is in Sri Lankan writing that we haven't had um, a convincing portrayal from the front lines from the inside but hopefully that's going to change in the and next do you think that's a, that's a matter of time or to do with the environment in Sri Lanka at the moment? <laughs> Perhaps there is a bit of fear I mean I know I, I sidestepped it when I was writing. I mean, there's one passage in the book where during a sports conversation, one of the English guys asks uh, WG, what's the difference between Sinhalese and Tamils? And he tries to articulate it, and in the end, he, he's unable to. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I do think that now um, there is room for stories to come out. Uh, whether they'd be allowed to come out is another story. That's the point, is that I think there is a fear, isn't there? There is a little bit of fear um, about writing about it. Is it just, uh, just very quickly, Ramesh, your Meta, Meta General, did you read that uh, in Gore? No, and uh, a friend of mine who, who uh, is a writer there said, you've got to be very careful with that story because I refer to a moustache. Uh, I, refer, I refer to a president with a large moustache. And uh, yeah, and uh, I was I was told to be careful. Okay. Uh, I think that I think that's a good question. It, it's it's very complicated, I suppose, because it's the issue of how literature engages with politics, I suppose. Um, and I think uh, on the broader side, yes, I think people are beginning to write about it. People making films about it, uh, but it is pretty early days. I mean, you have to remember that if you thinking about how war and its effect on writing is, you know, people are still writing about the First World War and discovering what to think about it. Um, and it's interesting how, the, you know, the, the time frame in which these things work. I think in Britain there are a lot of writers who are beginning to recognize that a generation that knew uh, not just the First World War, but actually the Second World War, that generation is passing, uh, that first-hand information. Those people who actually didn't speak about what happened in the Second World War, what their experience was, because they kept it closed. And now, sadly, memories are going, uh, you know, people are getting older, and there are writers, their children, or sort of my generation of writers, who are finding those stories slipping away, finding a way of engaging with that almost slipping away and having to reinvent a way of doing it. And in a place like Sri Lanka, I mean, the war is very, very, very recent. And, you know, how do you, how do you deal with it? But it does affect every writer. I have no doubt about that. Uh, I know it's affected me right from the beginning because, uh, you know, I started writing when I was very young, but for a long time I was writing about all sorts of things. When I actually came to write about Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka I didn't necessarily know but certainly felt um, it was really when, when, the, when the main trouble started back in, back in the 80s, in 83, and my first published story in a magazine um, was a story set at that time, I was writing at the time when 
uh, when all the rioting and the communal violence started. And that was something that affected me that I had to deal with uh, and that I had to engage with in a story. And it's, it's eventually found its way into my first book. But I suppose every book I've written has had to engage with the idea of how do you deal with um, politics. Sorry. I'm going to have to get up. Can I just, just say one thing? Can I just say one thing, though, on yeah, that, right. which is really, really important, because Roshi and I both went to Jaffna in January, and we did a reading uh, at the, at the uh, Jaffna Library, which is a hugely symbolic place. And it was a very emotionally important moment for both of us, but also for the audience there. And we did, in the end, read about uh, the stories that connected with the Troubles. Well, listen, I've been um, a very bad chair because I'm, I'm going to leave you up, and I will make it my job to get you up here, and whatever your question is, you get to put it to them personally. Uh, but we've run out um, uh, of our time with, uh, with people still wanting some more stories.